Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Cal Day. Uh, my name is Dan Wertheimer, and I want to talk to you about this question, are we alone? Um, is anybody out there? Uh, the field you may know is called SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And uh, I, I thought I'd get started with an equation. I'm sorry about this, but um, this you may know is the Drake Equation. The Drake Equation lets you calculate the number of civilizations that we could communicate with in our Milky Way galaxy. And um, all you have to do is multiply all those numbers together. And the problem with this equation is that we don't have any idea what any of these numbers are. <laughs> but I'll give you how an, an idea how it works. It's, it's, it's kind of a whittling down process. You start with the number of stars in the galaxy, and then you, a couple hundred billion stars. You say, how many of those stars have planets going around them? Uh, and then how many of those planets are good planets? Do they have the right temperature uh, and the right chemicals for life? And as you go further down the equation, um, if you have a good planet, what fraction of those good planets does life actually get started on? Um, and then the next thing, this I is for intelligence. So once you get life started on a planet, how often does it evolve and become intelligent? And then the next factor is, if you have intelligent life, does it develop this C communication? Does it develop communication technologies, uh, you know, radio, lasers, things that we could communicate with them with? And then the last factor is how long do they live? Um, our sun is about five billion years old. It's going to be around another few billion years. Some stars are 10 billion years old. So you can imagine very advanced civilizations that are billions of years ahead of us. And we, there may be a galactic internet out there that we can get on and learn about um, our future. And um, some people call SETI the archaeology of the future because it's likely the first civilizations we contact might be a billion or two billion years ahead of us. So we can learn how they got through their difficult times. Anyway, that's the Drake Equation. One of the factors in the Drake Equation was how many planets are there out there. And if you had asked astronomers or me 20 years ago, are there planets going around other stars, we would have said, well, we think so, but we really don't know. But that, you probably know, has all changed in the last 20 years. It, it's really hard to find the planets because they're little dinky things. You know, a million Earths could fit inside the sun, and they don't give off light on their own. And they're right next to this really bright thing. It's like looking for a firefly next to a searchlight. Um, so they, they've almost all of them been found indirectly. This was the first way they were found is that when the planet goes around the star, it pulls on the star a little bit and the star wiggles. And if you see a wiggling star, that betrays the presence of a planet. It doesn't wiggle very much. The star kind of moves at walking speed, but here's a star that's wiggling. And it's actually wiggling kind of fast and it's also wiggling slow. Anybody know why it's got those two kind of wiggles in there? Any guesses? Because it's more than one planet. Yeah. That's right, yeah. There's a fast wiggle because the planet is, is on in close to the star, going around rapidly. And there's a slower planet going around slowly. Actually, this one has five planets going around, I think. Um, the, the more recent way that they've been found is a little bit different. When a planet gets in front of the star, the star, the light will dim down a little bit. The, the planet will, will block. I don't know if you can see that little black dot there. Um, let me see if I can. OK, so there's the planet getting in front of the star. And this cr spacecraft, Kepler, its job was to just take pictures of 100,000 stars over and over again, hoping that some stars would get a little dimmer when the planet goes in front. And it found about 3,000 planets. And if you extrapolate to the little patch of the sky that it was looking at, and you multiply by all the patches of the sky that it could have looked at, um, it looks like there are a trillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy. That's five times more planets than there are stars. A lot of planets. And we think 5% of those planets are pretty nice planets that are at the right temperature. We call it the Goldilocks zone, where you're not, it's not too hot, you're not too close to the star, not too cold, not too far away from the star. And a lot of those planets, we think, have the right chemicals and liquid water where you might have life. Um, so one of the questions is, how does life get started? And we think it got started something like this called the primordial soup. And people have done experiments to kind of simulate uh, the early conditions on Earth. And then what you do is you put a, 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 inside a flask, you put some methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen. These were things that were around just as the Earth was forming. And you put in some sparks to simulate lightning. And you don't get gorillas crawling out of this thing, but you do get the basic building blocks of life, the amino acids and things that you and I are made of. Um, so we're beginning to understand how that life got started on this planet. And it didn't take long for life to get started on this planet. So we think if it didn't take long, that means it's probably a pretty straightforward process. And it will happen on other places as well. But we really don't know. 
There may even be primitive life in our own solar system. This is a cutaway view of a moon going around Jupiter called Europa. And uh, it's, it's covered with ice. That white stuff is representing ice. But the blue stuff is a liquid ocean. So underneath the ice, uh, there is this liquid ocean. And there may be something swimming around down there. We don't really know because the ice is 50 miles thick. And we don't know how to get through that ice. So sometimes when I go through to elementary schools and I talk to the kids about Europa, I ask the elementary school kids, how are we going to get through the ice? Because we really don't know. And the kids, well, the boys, usually the boys say uh, machine guns, you know, blast your way through, bombs, stuff like that. The girls are usually more clever. They say, you know, melt your way through, use some mirrors to reflect sunlight and, and focus it down on the, anyway, it's kind of, it's funny that at that early age, they've already figured out how they're going to get through the ice in different ways. Uh, anyway, uh, let's assume there's, there's life out there. Uh, how are we going to get in touch? How are we going to find out if there's, if there's intelligent life? So I, I'm just going to start with some of the interesting ideas. SETI remembers the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So uh, this is a mathematician, Carl Gauss, about 200 years ago. He suggested that we get in touch with ET by making large geometric structures on the Earth, a big uh, right triangle of pine trees, maybe three, four, five miles on a side, a big square of, wor of dirt, water, wheat, and then ET would look down with their high resolution telescopes and see that we knew about the Pythagorean theorem. And then maybe they get in touch with us. It was a cool idea, but not funded. And then uh, <laughs> von Littron, also a couple hundred years ago, he suggested we dig a circular ditch 20 miles across and fill the ditch with kerosene and use this match, not to scale, to make a bright uh, circular ring of fire. A bright, and ET would again look down with their high resolution telescopes and see this bright circle of light. And I, I think you can guess what happened with that project. And then um, Charles Crow, um, also a couple hundred years ago, suggested we get in touch with the Martians by reflecting light off these big mirrors to the Martians. Uh, and several mirrors, one where he lived in Paris, and the other is to outline the shape of the Big Dipper, and E.T. would see these bright lights and see this constellation, of, uh, and perhaps they get in touch. And, and, and it met with a, a similar fate. The first uh, funded project was to send pornography into space. Uh, <laughs> this is the plaque on the Pioneer 10 spacecraft. And see this uh, solar system, the sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, and Earth, and here's the spacecraft leaving. These are directions to Earth in case E.T. wants to uh, eat us. And then uh, these are very controversial figures. Originally they were holding hands, but NASA was worried that E.T. would think we were just one creature instead of two, so they're not holding. Anyway, that was the first kind of funded SETI project. Um, more recently we've been thinking that a good way to get in contact with E.T. would be to uh, look for radio or television signals. And the reason we're thinking about that is because Earth sends off a lot of radio and television. And this is a plot of television power leaving the Earth as a function of time, 1940, 1950. And you can see, uh, this is a log scale, so that we're getting brighter and brighter. We're growing exponentially. The Earth is brighter than the sun at television frequencies. And the television signals have been going out now for about 70 years. And the early television shows like I Love Lucy and Ed Sullivan have gone past about 10,000 stars. The nearby stars have seen The Simpsons. Our radio and tele television and radar signals have been blasting out into space, traveling at the speed of light. We've even sent messages on purpose. This was a, a, a message intentionally sent just for a couple minutes in, in 1974 uh, from the, a big telescope in Puerto Rico. And you can see this message, if they figure it out, has got a person and a DNA molecule. And this is the solar system. And there's, again, the sun and Mercury, Venus, Earth is tipped toward this person. This is the Arecibo telescope that it was sent from. This is the diameter of the telescope. These are um, amino acids, the things that you and I are made of. And these are binary numbers up here. I don't know if they'll figure that out, but it's kind of a fun little message. Um, anyway, so we at Berkeley and other groups are, are looking for radio signals or television or radar or maybe even a deliberate signal. So one possibility is we, we get some sort of artifact of their technology that wasn't intended for us. We intercept their, their in, uh, communication from their planet. Another possibility is maybe if they're interested in us, they might deliberately send us a message, which would be anti-cryptographically. Think if they, if they deliberately send us to us, it'll probably be easy. They'll make it easy to decode. It might contain a lot of information. Um, so I'm not the first guy to think of this. Um, uh, uh, more than 100 years ago, the early radio pioneers, Tesla, Marconi, uh, both searched for signals from ET. In the 20s, the Navy searched for 
radio signals from, from the Martians when Mars got close to the Earth. Um, anyway, so we've been doing this now since, um, since the 70s, um, and we have a, a group called the Berkeley SETI Research Center, and we collaborate with a, a lot of different organizations. Um, and there are 20 of us that, that work here at Berkeley on, on SETI looking for ET, and we're funded by uh, the National Science Foundation and NASA and the Templeton Foundation, and individuals that, that uh, give us donations and some companies that help us out. Um, and we have a lot of different experiments at different observatories. We have s things looking for radio signals and things looking for laser signals in the infrared at, and also at visible wavelengths. Um, Andrew Simeon back there is trying to do this project called Panchromatic SETI, where we look at all the different wavelengths that get to the Earth. This is a plot of all the different colors or wavelengths that get um, to the Earth. Anyway, this thing group is using a, a lot of different telescopes at these different wavelengths or different colors. Uh, to try to look for these signals from ET. This is one of the first telescopes that we used to do SETI up at uh, Hat Creek Observatory in, uh, near Mount Lassen. This is a, a University of California observatory. Um, and and uh, while we were using the telescope, this is what happened. Um, the dish there used to be up on top of the pedestal. And uh, then we used a different telescope. This is one in West Virginia. Um, this is 300 feet across. You can see this jogger down here. There's a, to get an idea of the scale. And while we were using this telescope, this is what happened. And, and you might ask, um, how did that happen? Um, the answer, according to the World Weekly News, <laughs> is that the aliens did not want to be discovered, and they zapped the telescope. Um, and so that's happened to us twice, that the aliens have zapped the telescope. So now we're using this telescope. This is the world's largest radio telescope. Um, this is a, a, a thousand feet across. It holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes although we haven't actually done that experiment. And uh, you might have seen it in the movie, um, in the James Bond movie, uh, what was it called, GoldenEye. In GoldenEye, they, they say it's in Cuba and it comes up out of the water, but it doesn't really do that. It's in Puerto Rico and it, it's on the ground. Um, and uh, the way this thing, um, oh, it was also in the movie Contact with Jodie Foster, which was a book written by Carl Sagan who worked with us on SETI and uh, knew a lot about SETI. Anyway, um, the way this thing works is that the, the surface down at the bottom is a big mirror uh, that's shiny in radio waves. It doesn't look shiny to you, but it, if you're a radio wave hitting that thing, it bounces off that aluminum mirror, and it, and it goes up to the receiver at the top there, and the receiver can move around. You can cover about a third of the sky. Um, and we figured out a way to use this telescope at the same time that other astronomers are using it, so we can actually do our SETI experiment 24 hours a day, all year round. I think we're collecting data right now um, as, as, as I'm talking to you on Cal Day. And that it makes it a very powerful way to do astronomy. Most astronomers are lucky to get a day or two a year on the world's biggest radio telescope. It's very competitive. And we've got this uh, technique we call uh, commensal or piggyback technique, where we're just kind of going along for a ride. Wherever the astronomers are pointing the telescope, we're going along looking for ET at the same time. The disadvantage of that is that we don't get to point the telescope, but that's OK because we don't know where to look anyway. One of our experiments are, was called Serendip. Um, we use acronyms because we get funding from NASA, and NASA requires that you use acronyms. Serendip is a search for extraterrestrial radio emissions from nearby developed intelligent populations. Um, and the, the first thing we were doing with Serendip was the easiest kind of signal is to look for uh, uh, a strong thing at some particular frequency. Um, and the, the, we call them channels or frequencies. And we were, what you want to do is kind of comb the radio dial looking for something strong at some frequency. Um, but you don't want to do it like one channel at a time because that takes a long time. So we, we built these machines that could look at many channels and measure how strong the signal was at each channel. And this is uh, channel number 2,264,191. 2, Here's channel number 2,264,959. You can see a strong signal there. It's kind of like tuning the radio dial, looking at the meter, and you see something peak up. That's what gets our interest. That's the kind of thing. And I wish I could tell you that was ET, but it, it's not. Um, it's a, I think it's a satellite that was flying over the telescope. We have a big problem with we're looking for extraterrestrial radio signals, but we find terrestrial radio signals. Um, it's called radio frequency interference, radio pollution. And it used to be this telescope was kind of out in the middle of nowhere in Puerto Rico, and there weren't transmitters around. But um, now uh, civilization is encroaching, and there's a lot of people with cell phones and satellites and planes. and um, and it's getting it harder and harder to do SETI from the ground. We may actually eventually have to go to the backside of the moon 
and do SETI experiments there where the moon would kind of shield from all the radio pollution coming from Earth, but that would be very expensive. So this is maybe a good time to do SETI before it gets really expensive. Um, so uh, one of the projects that we had was we wanted to look for a lot of different kinds of signals, but that takes a huge amount of computing power. <coughs> and so what we did is we, we ended up recording the data at the Arecibo telescope. We would record data and we keep it um, at this National Energy Supercomputing Center, which is here at Lawrence Berkeley Labs up the hill. And we record a huge amount of data, um, hundreds of petabytes of data. And then what we do is we ask uh, people around the world for help analyzing the data. If you have a computer at home or a laptop or something in the office or at school, if you want, you can help us analyze the data. It's called the SETI at Home Project. And the way SETI at Home works is you download this program um, called the SETI at Home Screensaver. It's a free program. Just Google SETI and you'll find it. You'll find SETI at Home. You download that Screensaver program. You install it on your Windows or your Mac computer, whatever you have. It actually works on cell phones now. And then you can, uh, the way it works is you'll be assigned a little par part of the data. When you go out for a cup of uh, coffee, um, the screensaver will pop up on your screen and you will be assigned a little part of the data. This is what it looks like when it's running on your home computer. It'll remind you what your name is and it'll tell you what part of the data you've been assigned. Um, it'll get a little piece of data from our server up at Space Science Labs up the hill and uh, you'll be assigned one part of the sky, you'll be assigned a different part of the sky, everybody gets a different part of the sky to work on and then um, it works on it and in the, when you're not using your computer and it's looking for any kind of strong signal that it that it might find looking through all those different frequencies and different signal types and it might take a few days to go through that chunk of data that you've been assigned we call it a work unit and then when it's done analyzing the data it will send the results any strong signals that it finds back to our server up the hill and uh, your name is attached to that data so if you're a lucky one that finds ET you get the Nobel Prize um, but you might have to share it with me and maybe Jack or Andrew up there uh, uh, you might have to share it with a lot of people, actually, because um, there are um, 8 million people who've downloaded the SETI at Home screensaver. The Nobel Prize is about a million and a half dollars. You have to divide it 8 million ways. You're not going to get rich. Um, so they, the SETI at Home volunteers have built one of the biggest supercomputers on the planet, and they've done a much more sensitive search that we could have done. Uh, is anybody here participating in SETI at Home? <coughs> so thank you. We're, we're very grateful to you, and I hope the rest of you will download SETI at home and help us find ET and collect that Nobel Prize with me and Andrew and Jack. So um, if you want to participate in SETI at home, if you want, you don't have to do this, but you can join a, a team. There are several thousand teams that you can, and you can make your own team. And there's uh, school teams and university teams and small, medium, large size companies. And th these teams compete with each other. Here's, you know, IBM has donated 2,000 years of computing time. And uh, this competition has led to some bizarre behavior. This gentleman uh, doesn't just have one computer, he's built a whole farm of computers so that he can um, uh, analyze a lot of these work units and his name will be close to the top of the website. Um, and uh, this guy, he's got another one of these clusters of computers. You can go to this website called setifarm.org and, and by the way, they're all guys. There are no women that do this. Uh, I'd like to know if any of you know why he's got the bolt cutters there imposing for his SETI, in front of his SETI cluster. I'd like to know what, the, what that has to do with SETI. Um, anyway, though, we haven't found ET, but there are a lot of people now helping us find ET, and we're especially excited because there are a lot of kids running SETI at home, and we developed a curriculum um, with the Lawrence Hall of Science <coughs> where the kids use SETI at home, and they learn a little bit about this, this, um, this thing, uh, this question, are we alone, is, is a great thing for kids because it, the, it touches on a lot of different science questions about biology and chemistry and how did life get started and evolution and you can learn astronomy and physics and, uh, and a little bit about computing and a little bit about sociology and uh, what might be in our future. So there, it, all those factors in the Drake equation uh, are great questions for kids and, and, and anyway, it's a kind of fun curriculum. The SETI Home Project led to a more general thing uh, which we did called volunteer computing uh, or public participation scientific supercomputing. Um, and now you can use our software to participate in a lot of different projects. There are about 100 projects that you can choose from and you can allocate how you want your computer to be used. Um, so you can say, I want 20% of my spare computing cycles to be used for 
for global warming, climate research, and 30% for malaria drug research and cancer drug research or HIV drugs. You can pick the projects that you're most interested in. You can pick SETI at home, of course, climate prediction, gravity waves. Uh, this is a project called Astropulse, looking for, um, we don't know what, they're, what they are. We're trying to find more of them. Uh, this is protein folding. Anyway, there's a lot of projects that you can pick from that started using our software that started with SETI at home. The idea is that most of the computing <coughs> uh, power in the world is, is actually at the edges of the internet. It's computers that you and I own. Um, it's not in these big supercomputing centers. Um, now there are about a billion machines out of the edges of the internet. Uh, we call it the democratization of supercomputing, scientific supercomputing. That led to another kind of idea where <coughs> some projects, some kind of projects are not very good for computers. You need humans, you need brains, you need eyeballs. <coughs> and we call those uh, citizen science uh, projects or thinking at home projects. Our first project um, was a thing called Stardust. Um, there was a thing we flew uh, that, that picked up the dust from a comet. And we wanted to, and it came back to Earth with little dust particles. And we wanted to find those little dust particles and pick them out of the aerogel foam and then figure out what they were made of so we can figure out what the comet was made out of. And the problem is, so this is the aerogel that flew on the Stardust spacecraft. And inside there, there's little microscopic particles. And we wanted to find out the microscopic particles so we could analyze them and figure out the comet. But the problem is, there's a lot of stuff to look through. It would have needed thousands of students looking through microscopes for years. And so what we did is we put it on an automated microscope and took millions and millions of photographs. And you can sign up for Stardust at home, and you can help us find the particles. And if you find a particle, you get your name on the paper. And the volunteers have found more, much more than we could have done with our uh, students at Space Science Labs. Anyway, that led to a lot of these citizen science projects that you can participate in and use not just your computer, but use your eyes and brains to help us do a lot of different things. I want to get back to SETI for a second. Um, this is a project that Andrew Simeon is leading. Uh, Andrew, are you in the back? I saw you somewhere. Is he gone? Oh, OK. So um, Andrew, is a, he was a student here, and, and now he's uh, finished his PhD. And he's got this project called Interplanetary Eavesdropping. And the idea is that um, if they're not sending signals to us, maybe we could eavesdrop on their signals. And there might be particularly good times to eavesdrop on their signals. So uh, up here um, on, the, on the left, we've got uh, an example of two planets in a distant um, solar system maybe talking to each other, sending messages back and forth. Maybe it's kind of similar to what maybe someday we'll go to Mars and there'll be people on Mars and we'll want to talk to those people on Mars uh, and they'll want to talk back to us or we'll want to talk to robots on Mars. But imagine uh, a little more advanced civilization that, than us and it, it's got people or robots on on two planets and they're sending messages back and forth, we now can predict exactly when those two planets are lined up with Earth. And we can then look exactly, we have a schedule uh, from the Kepler spacecraft, we know kind of when that happens and we can intercept that planet to planet communication. So we call that interplanetary eavesdropping. So that's one of the new projects we're working on. Um, another, oh, this is the telescope we use for that. The big air sea boat uh, thing can't point to a lot of the planets that we, where we know they're in line with us. So we use this, this is the second largest telescope on the planet, which can point anywhere on the sky pretty much um, in Green Bank, West Virginia. Another new thing we're doing in the Netherlands is looking at low frequency SETI. This is the, the first SETI experiment. This is this uh, antenna array called LOFAR. This is uh, looking for low frequencies. Uh, you want to try a lot of different frequencies. and Nobody's ever tried low frequencies before, so we thought we'd try that. We're also looking for ET at the center of the galaxy. We're also looking for laser signals. This is a, uh, an experiment on Mount Wilson. It's three telescopes. It was built by a guy named Charlie Towns who invented the laser. Um, he got a Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, he died last, last month um, he, at 99 and a half. Actually, he made it to 100 because he died at 99.502. <laughs> and if, you, if you're a scientist, you round to 100. And Charlie came into work like every day until he was 99. He was all, his office is next to mine. He just kept working. He was an incredible guy. Um, anyway, so we're doing these optical and infrared SETI experiments that actually Charlie uh, Towns, the guy who invented the laser, told us we should do. Uh, uh, we're doing this uh, at a small telescope, about 20 minutes drive from here, that Berkeley runs called Leuschner. We're doing it at Lick Observatory, which is about two hour drive from here um, in uh, San Jose. Oh, by the way, Alex Filipenko is going to give a talk about all the different things that are going on at Lick Observatory today. 
Um, and uh, this, oh, this is the experiment we're doing at Lick. Uh, this is a, a telescope, and this is Frank Drake, the guy that invented the Drake equation. And uh, I'm there. And Shelley Wright, who was one of our students, built a new machine. And Remstone, the director of the observatory. We're also doing an experiment at the Keck telescope in Hawaii. Uh, this is a thing um, on top of Mount Kea on the, on the Big Island. Um, this is the biggest optical telescope on the planet. And we're looking for laser signals there. That's led by Jeff Marcy, who's the guy that found a huge number of planets. He's a big leader here at Berkeley um, um, finding extrasolar planets, the first planets going around other stars. And he, his students were the ones that figured out there's a trillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, lots of planets. Well, we haven't found ET yet, but we've had a few spin-offs. Um, one of the big spin-offs was that, uh, the, all that volunteer computing and citizen science projects. Another spin-off was that the instruments that we used for SETI are now used by a lot of different people to do other kinds of experiments. Um, and uh, for instance, this guy, Matthew Bales, uh, used our instruments that we developed for SETI to find a planet made out of solid diamond. Uh, my wife wants to go there, bring it back. I, I don't know how to do that. Um, we, we used these instruments for SETI to make the first maps of the black hole in the center of the galaxy and got on the cover of Nature. We used them to find the biggest pulsar ever yet found, made the, thir the theorists squirm. They don't know what the hell's going on. We used them a little bit in brain research, trying to get signals out of a brain to control procedures. Anyway, they've been kind of successful at making other discoveries in other areas of science, but no ET. Well, one of the things I'm excited about is, the, is kind of where Earthlings are going, even though we haven't found them yet. I'm optimistic in the long run. I think we're just kind of learning how to do this. We're getting in the game. The technology is changing fast, though, so I think it may happen in our lifetimes. And this is a, this is a new telescope that's being built um, in southern China. Uh, called the FAST telescope, and it's bigger than Arecibo. It's 500 meters across instead of 300 meters, and we're hoping to do, work with the Chinese to do some SETI on that experiment. And we're also, the new thing in, in uh, astronomy is learning how to build a, a big telescope out of lots and lots of little telescopes. And this is on the drawing board. This is called the Square Kilometer Array. It'll be made out of 4,000 telescopes all connected together to make a giant telescope. It's being built in South Africa and also in Australia, and we're hoping to use that telescope to look for ET. It'll be a much more powerful search. Uh, but that's about 10, uh, maybe 20 years away. Um, but this is the kind of a plot of the progress we've made. Um, remember, I, I was talking about one of the ideas in SETI is we don't know what frequency to look for. So you want to look at a lot of different frequencies at once, a lot of channels at once. And the first thing that I built looked at 100 channels. And then we had 65,000 channels. Then we had 4 million, 168 million. We just built one that has 5 billion channels. And um, so I'm. We're still, you know, five billion is not enough. So, but if, you, if, the, if that progress continues, the Moore's Law technology progress, it's driven, mostly it's not driven by SETI, right? It's driven by gamers and the computer industry. Um, and so if that trend continues, uh, then I think eventually we will have uh, um, the technology where we might be able to find these signals if they're out there. This is a plot of computing power as a function of time and how smart computers are getting. Uh, right now, computer is as smart as a guppy or maybe a lizard. Um, but if that trend continues, computers will be as smart as humans, uh, maybe 2030, 2040, something like that. That's called the singularity. Uh, when computers start designing themselves, a lot of interesting things happen. Maybe good, maybe bad. Watch out. Um, in the long-term future, we could use our sun as a gravitational lens. And that would be um, very exciting. That would be a telescope that's the size of the sun. I remember, a million Earths could fit inside the sun. So that's a big telescope. If we could pull that off, there's a lot of technical challenges. But if we could pull that off, we could read license plates on a distant planet going around another star. Um, so if you've been asleep, um, this is kind of the only slide you have to remember. Um, <laughs> no ET so far. Uh, we're still working on it. I got a few more little summary slides. Um, and then we'll do this. Oh, if you want to learn more, um, you don't have to remember this website. Just Google SETI. Just remember SETI, and you'll find SETI at home. You can download the screensaver. You'll find the website. You'll find a lot of information about SETI. And also, if you want to watch some videos, there's this fun video called The Great Debate, Are We Alone? And uh, it was uh, myself, Dan, and, and Jeff Marcy, the guy that's found all these planets. And Jeff wore all black, and I wore all white. And Jeff said, um, uh, I'll paraphrase them. Dan, you're wasting your time. You're never going to find them. They're not out there. And I said, just any minute, you know, we're just beginning. Just, just wait a little bit. Uh, but it took us about an hour. And, uh, 
and, and we argue back and forth about whether we're alone or not. It's kind of a fun debate. And if you watch that thing, you uh, can vote at the end of who you think will, who you think won the debate, and I hope you'll vote for me. Um, and by the way, right now I'm winning about two to one. Um, I, also, I also wanted to tell you about some haiku. Um, so these volunteers that help us in Set at Home, they help us in a lot of ways. So the big way they help us, of course, is they, they download the screensaver and they help us analyze the data from the Arecibo telescope and other telescopes. And we're very grateful to the Set at Home volunteers. But they also send money. That's very useful. Pays the students. Um, they also help us write the code. It's a big open source project. And a lot of computer programmers out there have helped us develop and fix up the code and add new features and new operating systems. Um, and then they've, they've composed things. They've composed literature, music about SETI. And they've also composed haikus. And there are thousands of haikus that you can read on the website. And, but don't read, I'm not going to read you all thousands. I'm, I'm just going to read you a couple of haikus that the volunteers have sent. Uh, Paula Cook at Duke University, searching for life, answers are revealed about ourselves. And uh, one more haiku. Uh, Dan Seidner, one million earthlings, bounded by optimism, leave their PCs on. And by the way, I don't recommend, don't leave your PC on for us. It uses a lot of energy. Turn it off. Um, but, but it's a good haiku. The sense of the eavesdropping. So we're a little bit worried that ET may not be d deliberately sending us signals. Uh, you know, they might have seen oxygen in our atmosphere and... Uh, maybe if they're very nearby, they might have seen our TV signals, but they might say, oh, these guys are still killing each other. We don't want to get in touch yet. So, um, so is there some way that we could detect other civilizations besides if they're deliberately sending us something? And then the idea is, well, um, Earthlings are, we're, we're blasting stuff into space right now, but we may get quieter. We're going to more efficient communication with cables and fibers and very directed kind of communication. So we may not just blast stuff into space the way we're, we're doing that now. That's a lot of power that we're wasting. So maybe advanced civilizations don't leak a lot of power. So why? Then we have to think about reasons that they might be blast sending off signals. And so we're thinking, well, maybe they're talking to each other. If they're on a, distant, on a planet in their own solar system, maybe they're sending messages back and forth. And so that was just an idea. We've got a lot of different ideas, and our kind of general strategy is to try a lot of different ideas, because we really don't know. It's really hard to predict what a civilization a billion years out is going to be doing. And, and I think, you know, I showed you some of those ideas that from a couple hundred years ago. Uh, those at the time were our best ideas, and now we're just kind of laughing. So I imagine in 200 years, people are going to look at me and say, oh, you Dan, you stupid idiot, you know, why didn't you use tachyons or something like that? So, so we, right. So, um, you probably know, well, you know, but maybe not the rest of everybody, that the bigger the telescope, the more resolution you have. And the, 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 re the resolution you can see is, is kind of um, proportional to the size of the telescope. So right now, the biggest telescope we have at optical wavelengths is 10 meters. Um, and you can see things that are sort of better than, I don't know, a tenth of an arc second or something like that, which is, you know, a ten thousandth of a degree. But if you could make something really big, then you know, you could get that angular resolution down. So how do you do that? Well, if the, it turns out that, that things that have gravity bend light, and the sun has a lot of gravity, and Einstein predicted this, that the light from a star or a planet would bend around the, the sun and come to a focus. Now the problem is that where it comes to a focus is out beyond Pluto, so you've got to put your camera out beyond Pluto. And the other problem is that not only do you have to put your camera out there, but it's moving pretty fast, so you've got to move your camera around, otherwise things get all blurry. So there's a lot of technological problems, and as Jack there has pointed out, another problem is that the sun is really bright, and you're looking right at the sun, so you've got to stick your finger in front of the sun, block that light out, and you've got to do better than that. Anyway, so it's not easy, so you, got, you may have to wait a thousand years or so.